Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where I hasten to add the intelligence comes to my guests. Uh, and we're going to have a discussion with uh, Laura Friedman. And what, the reason I want to do this is this is somebody who is, you know, taking a position on what's going on between Israel and Gaza, but she does it from a really informed perspective, uh, worked in the U.S. government. I'll let her lay it out, has an academic uh, training and background and uh, has grown up as a Jewish person trying to figure out her relation to Israel, which is really the point of this discussion. I can't stand the stereotyping, which basically marginalizes or rejects any Jewish person who raises any questions about the Jewish lobby of APEC or uh, about what Israel is doing. And it seems to me to be a basically a denial of what the Jewish experience is all about particularly uh, diaspora Jews, which is, of course, and, but also Talmudic Jews questioning everything and dialogue. So I am trying to have a dialogue here. So take it away, Laura Freeman. Tell me about your connection with this issue and you know, also your views and what's going on. Sure. I mean, that, that's a huge opening question. First of all, thank you for having me. I think you and I come from very similar sort of intellectual backgrounds on all this. I I, I feel like I want to listen to your thoughts as much as I want to share my own. Um, but yes, I'm Lara Friedman. I am a Jewish American. I grew up in Arizona, um, I think in a fairly typical Jewish American family. Israel was not central to our identity or our um, Judaism. Judaism was central to our identity. We were very active in our community. My parents were founding members of a reform synagogue in Tucson. Um, that was one of the key key elements of my upbringing. Um, my grandfather, I will say, was a very proud and, and active Zionist. Um, he was from a generation that saw the creation of Israel as um, a miracle and the savior of the Jewish people. Um, he and my grandmother traveled to Israel in 1967, right after the war. This all was sort of like in the backdrop of my life, but it was never central. And I've got to say that, you know, I, I think I had the baseline sort of Zionism of most Jewish Americans taking for granted that Israel is good and what Israel does is right and that criticism of Israel is almost always illegitimate. It is almost always anti-Semitic and should be um, basically just ignored and Israel should be defended. That started to get more complicated for me as I as I grew up and, you know, I was raised in, in a Jewish community and a family that prized intellectual uh, uh, discourse and interrogating the world around you and interrogating the assumptions around you. And there's never a great deal of interrogation of assumptions about Israel, which is something I became really aware of, uh, you know, in high school, learning about the world, and then particularly in college when I actually started meeting people from the Middle East. Um, I... I joke that my entry point into Middle East politics and diplomacy was playing pool at the University of Arizona. I love to play pool. Um, and uh, most of the students who hung around um, playing pool at the University of Arizona were from the Middle East, um, overwhelmingly from Lebanon at the time. They were there because of the Lebanon Civil War. There was a huge group of uh, scholarship students at the University of Arizona. And we got into arguments about Israel. And I tried to defend what I thought I knew in my beliefs and discovered pretty quickly that I didn't know enough to defend what my opinions, my, my sort of not well thought out opinions were. And that led me on a journey of taking classes. <laughs> and once you start opening the door to studying and questioning and challenging, I think when it comes to Israel, and this was, you know, in the 80s and into the early 90s, you, you sort of have a choice as you're studying. You can come in and say, I'm going to look for information that validates everything I was taught to believe, and I'm going to find um, intellectual path pathways that let me dismiss the things that I don't, that don't support those beliefs, or I'm going to actually learn and take on all the information and come up possibly with a whole new set of views informed by what I now have come to know. Um, so I entered college, sort of a passive Zionist. I exited college a deeply questioning person who still had a felt I had a, a strong connection to Israel, but didn't really think about it very much. Um, and then I joined the Foreign Service and just almost by chance in my first position in the Foreign Service, I was sent to Jerusalem. So I was in Jerusalem from 92 to 94. So for the Oslo process and you know the Hebron massacre and other things, and I was thrown into the deep end of the complicated um, aspects 
of caring about Israel, which started with my main job was being um, the settlements officer in Jerusalem for a year and a half. So I spent the better part of two years driving around the West Bank, um, meeting with settlers and visiting settlements and looking at what was being done in the West Bank at that time um, in terms of taking land, um, building Jewish only roads, building you know, plans for expanding and taking over all of the area, really all the plans that have come to fruition in the 20, 30 years since then. Um, and I lived in East Jerusalem and I had Palestinian neighbors and I learned from them. And, you know, coming out of all that, I'm a very different person. You can't, you can't unknow what you know, you can't unsee what you've seen. Um, and I think that this is one of the reasons I think that people who are very um, orthodox, black and white in their worldviews, prefer that their children not meet other people and not have experiences that challenge those views because um, living and meeting other people will challenge your views. Um, and, and today, um, I, I don't come to this, I don't come to the issue of Palestine and Israel as a Jewish American or as a Jewish person who's you know, trying to constantly figure out my, my views on Israel, I come to this as a human being and as a foreign policy uh, subject matter expert who has now spent decades um, immersed in the field, um, learning Arabic, spending time on the ground. And, you know, my views are my views. And that is you, very You difficult. know, actually, I think three, four languages, don't you? Um, I... I <laughs> I, might, I come from a family um, that has a, the, the, we have a lot of linguists in my family. So my, my best language is English uh, and then French and Spanish and Arabic and my Hebrew, I joke, I can muddle through. And I, I thought I had decent Italian until I went to Italy and realized that I, I don't have great Italian. And, and you have a Bissell Yiddish also? A Bissell, you know, oh, <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, but I, I was impressed with your background, and I, I didn't mention you're currently the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Yes. Uh, and, but I, I, and, and we'll talk about that. But you were actually, and people should know, don't know about the Foreign Service, it's an incredibly honorable uh, tradition in American politics, right? You're supposed to be the people who really know something. And right, and absolutely, I was very, very proud to serve in the foreign service. Yeah, and and uh, doesn't get mentioned enough, but you know, uh, well, I mean, Graham Greene, who I think is one of the great writers about world affairs, was in the British equivalent, I think, of the foreign service, and wrote the best books really about what was happening in the post world war, post World War Two world. But you were there at a particularly interesting point when you were in the Foreign Service. So you were reporting at the embassy, right? Uh, I was at the consulate. At the time, we, you know, the U.S. for years going back, you know, 100 years before the birth of the state of Israel had a consulate in Jerusalem, which after 48 and then after 67 was the interface to the Palestinians as well as to Israelis living within the catchment area of the consulate. And it was a consulate general, so it reported directly to the State Department. It didn't report. Normally, in other places, a consulate is subsidiary to an embassy, so all political reporting will go through that embassy um, with the consulate general in Jerusalem up until Trump, when he, Trump closed that mission. Up until the Trump era, you had direct reporting from the consulate to, to Washington. Okay. But this was also when Bill Clinton was president. Right. So I joined right at the end of the Clinton administration. Yeah. Oh. Um, Towards the end, not right at the end. Yes. At the. Uh, yeah. Uh, why am I missing something here? You said ninety-two. To Actually, no. I, yeah, ninety-two to ninety-four. Yes, I'm thinking about who signed my first consular commission. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was in. I went to. I, I went. To, I was in Jerusalem, ninety-two to ninety-four. Yeah, the, and and you mentioned the Oslo Accords. So this yes. is Clinton's initiative. Yes, right? of course. Yeah. So for people who are, are not familiar with this, uh, this was a particularly optimistic moment or time for peace breaking out, and Bill Clinton actually played a, a leading role in taking risks and so forth to make this happen. And you were a witness to that, right? And this is where yeah, uh, I mean, Rabin and Arafat uh, shook hands. And So why don't you tell people who don't know that? Because that, you know, here Kamala Harris in her debate uh, with Donald Trump uh, mentioned she still favors a two-state solution. Uh, nowadays, people think, wait a minute, there, there, so much of the settlers have taken over so much land, uh, it would be a parody of a, a South African, you know, apartheid. Uh, but 
at that time, there was real optimism. And I don't know if you're familiar. I always try to get people listening to this to watch a movie called The Gatekeepers. Yeah. And The Gatekeepers movie, which is an Israeli film, and the only people who speak in it are people who led Shin Bet, the Israeli security agency that controlled the West Bank and Gaza yeah. and so forth. And before that, uh, still were responsible for domestic security. And that movie really explodes the myth uh, that Israel was a united nation that wanted peace. And the only thing that disrupted it was these uh, Palestinians who couldn't live peaceably because they're basically flawed and violent and crazy. And that movie makes it very clear that the contradiction in Israel between people who actually uh, cared about peace or at least talked as if they did. I was there at the time of the Six-Day War, and then the Labor Party people and all that who were in charge uh, talked a good game about peace, even said things to me. I remember I talked to Alon and, and briefly to Rabin and these people. They said, if you come back in 10 years and we're still occupying, it won't be in Israel I want to live in. We have to find a way and so forth. So whether they really believe that or not, uh, I don't know. Uh, I wasn't an expert on the area. Uh, but uh, it, it was certainly the conventional thought that if you occupy a people for any length of time, you are going to destroy the very idea of, uh, you know, a Jewish, uh, predominantly Jewish state of tolerance and understanding and so forth. So you are actually a witness to how that came apart. No? Look, I mean, I think a lot of people witnessed it over time, but I mean, the when the Oslo process broke, and I think it's important to emphasize the U.S. was not the give mover. The, give us dates here because to, to help people follow this. So you arrived, you said in... I in, arrived in uh, November 1992, and I left in November 1994. Yeah. So what was going on when you hit the ground there, you're in Jerusalem, and there's this whole kind of diplomacy, right? So, so what, so look, when I, when I arrived, it was, it was the, the last sort of dregs of the first intifada. It wasn't, it, it wasn't Oslo. Oslo didn't happen gradually. Oslo appeared overnight for people on the ground. And that's one of the criticisms of Oslo since then is that it was this top down, um, this top down process that came from the outside and was sort of just announced. I mean, when I got there, we were still sort of tracking post intifada violence, and there was still a framing in Israel that saw Palestinians as the you know the, the great enemy, and Arafat was framed as a Nazi. Um, the process that led to Oslo was a private process between Palestinians and Israelis. It was sponsored by, obviously, the Norwegians. That's why it's called the Oslo process. The U.S. had nothing to do with it and I think was largely kept out of it because I think the assumption was that if the U.S. had been involved in that process behind the scenes, it would have somehow wrecked it. Um, the U.S. had a way of going in and you know being, being more demanding than the Israelis when it came to, to the demands that it made of Palestinians. Um, when the Oslo process broke, the U.S. embraced it and took on the role of the steward of this process, the leader of the process. But it really did basically happen overnight. We went to bed one night, and it was this this sense of you know this 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 friction and cons constant concern of things bubbling up again along the lines of the first intifada. And then we woke up the next morning, and there had been this exchange of letters, and then and then we eventually had the handshake in Washington. And it was sort of like there's suddenly this new era of, you know, Palestinians, you know, sort of, I went with Palestinian friends of mine to West Jerusalem. They hadn't ever been there. And we met Israelis who said, who never said the word Palestinian before. It was hard for them to even, you saw them kind of tasting the word for the first time. And I think that there was a, a moment of people sort of holding their breath and suspending disbelief to see if this could actually turn into something that both sides could live with. I think that was that was, there was a real moment of possibility there, but the Oslo Agreement, and I remember you know sitting in the consulate when it when we, when we actually got the the text of the Oslo Agreement, going through it with my little uh, those little you know stickies that you put on to mark pages, and I was going through with a, with a highlighter and stickies marking all the pages where I saw what what in diploma in diplomatic speak we call constructive ambiguity, language which had been deliberately left ambiguous in order to allow both sides to read it the way they wanted to, in order to allow them to sign something without having to get into the nitty and gritty of whether they agreed on what it meant. And I remember saying to a colleague at the time, there's enough constructive ambiguity in this document to drive all the settlements in the West Bank through these holes and to keep expanding settlements forever, which is exactly what happened. 
I mean, we had a surge in settlement construction after Oslo. We had, you know, people don't realize that before Oslo was announced, again, I lived in East Jerusalem, we would travel freely to the West Bank. There were no checkpoints between the West Bank and Jerusalem. Immediately after Oslo, checkpoints sprung up. And those checkpoints kept moving further and further out to expand the boundaries of Jerusalem and to keep Palestinians out. Um, there was an, a, a ratcheting up of pressure on Palestinians that came immediately after the, the outbreak of the peace process. And, you know, I, and, and sort of taking the, the 10,000 foot view of this, uh, you know, years later, I was in Washington at a, at a, a, a meeting with um, the then ambassador to the U.S. from Egypt, Nabil Fami, who went on to be the foreign minister from Egypt. And he was talking about, he was speaking quite hopefully about Israel-Palestine, saying he didn't think that the progress that had been made up till that point, which at that point was the early aughts, could be rolled back easily. Um, but he was talking about, you know, the Egypt-Israel peace treaty and the Jordan-Israel peace treaty and, and really how it differed from the peace talks with, Palest with the Palestinians. And he described Egypt and Jordan peace treaties as having been negotiated based on a balance of interests, as opposed to the Israel-Palestine peace treaty, which was always negotiated based on a balance of power. And a balance of interests, no matter how tough things get, both sides have an interest in continuing. A balance of power, one side may have an interest in saying, I can get more by not continuing, either side, um, because the, the power dynamic is not, is not equalized. Um, and I think that became very clear um, as the underlying dynamic of Oslo very, very quickly. You know, you've touched on what is, to my mind, mind the m profound immorality of the treatment of the Palestinians. Because, first of all, this, people don't realize that Israel came to control the West Bank, Gaza, the Golan Heights, and part of Jerusalem as a result of a war that was a war, I would argue, and I think most of the evidence would support it, was a war of choice. Uh, it was a preemptive war. There was a massing of troops in the Sinai and so forth and so on. But that part i quite familiar with because I was there at the end and I interviewed lots and lots of people. And But the fact is, it wasn't a war with the Palestinians. Nobody claimed that the Palestinians in the West Bank or in Gaza, let alone in Israel, Palestinians in Israel, some of them even gave blood for the Israeli army because they thought the country was something sack and so forth, they were had some kind of, you know, relationship to citizenry and so forth. But the Palestinians living in the West Bank and in Gaza and, and uh, in Jerusalem and the Golden Heights, uh, in fact, ha were under the administration and control in the West Bank by Jordan and uh, uh, Gaza by Egypt, the Golden Heights by Syria. And the irony is that Israel managed to make peace because of what you're saying, the relation of power. I never heard it put quite the way you did, but they wanted something. Also, the United States, which was kind of involved in negotiating this and other foreign powers, had to respect Egypt because it had power. Jordan had power and a position in the area and obviously Syria. And the, the, so the people who were alleged to be threatening Israel or actually were a military threat, it would be primarily Egypt under Nasser, it was no problem making peace with them. You know, like you say, oh, you have something we have, we have to get along. The only people that Israel didn't have to get along with were the Palestinians, and, and because they had no power. But they also were not the people who started the war. So from a legal and moral point of view, I never could understand how with a straight face, Anyone, and when I was there at the end of the six day war, nobody defended permanent occupation that I talked to because most of the people I talked to seemed to have the same politics I had. They were, you know, kind of liberal left Zionists or what have you. None of them defended at that time settlements or permanent occupation or denying these people their basic human rights. And what the UN is now investigating in different courts and what really uh, is basic to this whole question is does it was ever a shred of moral support that one could respect for Israel's occupation of these people, uh, the Palestinians, and denying them their fundamental human rights? 
I don't even understand how this got reported all these years and discussed all these years without with denying something that our American civil rights movement was so critical, but also every struggle for freedom, one person, one vote, right? Uh, the idea of agency. And we've accepted as normal somehow in this part of the world, people who never attacked Israel, who were farming their land, working there, living a life going back centuries, you know, uh, and, and somehow you could take away all of their rights. And now if you're at a university and you say, well, you know, I can understand why there might be some anger on the other side. I can understand why a group like Hamas might have some support because after all, no one else was helping these people. You will probably be fired. You know, maybe the show could be canceled right now, just even for saying that. You know, and yet, if you think of the logic of it from a human rights point of view, right, it wasn't even, you're not even allowed to, when you occupy people in war, like we, Germany, right, we move very quickly to German, so we've given us the greatest crime of human history. Somehow, they were normal within months. Oh, we're going to build back West Germany, you know, and get it going again. And these people have full rights, and right, and no one questioned that they should have, even though a number of them had voted for Hitler, you know. But with the case of the Palestinians, it's totally left out of discussion. The, the instant denial of their right to control anything about their life. Yeah, I I, I agree. I mean, the, the, the entirety of Israel's existence has been grounded in a series of narratives and it's almost a, a, a sort of a pick along a menu for which narrative best suits you at what moment. There is the narrative of manifest destiny. This land is ours. We're returning to the land. We are the legitimate indigenous people, which in effect treats the Palestinians who are there as at best, um, well, not their fault, but they are usurpers. And at worst, they are active usurpers who have taken what is rightfully the belonging to the Jewish people. So you've got the manifest destiny piece of it. You have the, the post-World War II Nazi piece of it, which basically says Israel is the only place in the world where, where, where Jews can, can exercise their right to self-determination. And after World War II, that means it's the only place in the world where Jews can be safe. And anyone standing in the way of that is akin to Nazis. This is a security issue. This isn't about anything else. Then you've got the truly messianic part, which says this isn't about what part of the land of Israel the Jewish people reclaim. It's about reclaiming all of it. And that's why, you know, after, you know, 48, there were always intentions by some people in Israel and some supporters of Israel, we need to expand the borders. And you can make the argument, yes, we're doing it for security, or you're doing it because as the settlers will have told me for years, you know, Tel Aviv is not the precious place in the Bible for the Jewish people. Hebron is, right? That's where the cradle of our, our, our Judaism is found. You know, Shiloh and Eli, the settlements out in the Northern West Bank, those are the places named in the Bible. It's not Jaffa and Haifa, right? Um, so you, you have these these parallel universes of arguments, and and along the way, I mean, I'm saying this as someone who's raised in the United States. When you have effectively framed any Palestinian who resists, essentially being labeled as a usurper, a non-legitimate party, there, someone who doesn't have any rights, and you frame any resistance to that narrative as either um, support for terrorism, anti-Semitism, or actual terrorism itself, at that point, you, you've eliminated, you, you've imposed upon the entirety of the Palestinian nation globally a, a, a label of illegitimacy and, and dehumanization. And essentially, if you look in the, the, the years of the peace process, which really became a process for how to not grant the Palestinians self-determination. I mean, you can redefine peace to me, whatever you mean, whatever you want. But, but along the way, you've effectively said Palestinians have no rights. They don't have political rights. They don't have human rights. They don't have legal rights. What they have are potential benefits that they may be allowed to enjoy if they meet the demands of Israel, the international community along the way. And these rights are also, um, they're not irrevocable, right? So like Palestinian residents of Jerusalem, they do not have rights as citizens. They, they enjoy benefits that are given to them magnanimously by Israel that can be taken away by Israel 
for any technical reason, for a political reason. As, as my colleague in Jerusalem, Danny Seidemann, said, the Palestinians in East Jerusalem who've been there for generations, their very existence hangs by a thread. Their, their existence as Jerusalem is treated by Israel as a revocable privilege, not a right. Whereas you or I, as Jewish Americans, could basically claim a right of return tomorrow, get an Israeli passport, and move anywhere we want inside the land of Israel, which by Israeli law and regulation lets us move almost anywhere in the West Bank at this point, too. Um, so we, we've created a... Those of us who work on Israel-Palestine talk a lot about the need to de-exceptionalize the conflict. We, we, we exist in a universe where Israel has become what my mom would call terminally unique. It's been exceptionalized. International law cannot be allowed to apply because if it applies, what Israel does to the Palestinians cannot be justified, cannot be tolerated. Therefore, international law, international organizations, the UN, the ICC, ICJ, must all be termed to be illegitimate and anti-Semitic. Because if you apply the same rules to Israel as everybody else, then Israel comes on the wrong side. So the problem can't be Israel, it has to be the rules. Right. But what I'm trying to call your attention to is what I think is a, a, a I, and I may be wrong, I don't have your expertise and certainly your on-the-ground experience and your language. But just as I say, as somebody who reported from the area at the time of the Six-Day War, the description you offer, yes, there you could find that in Zionist literature. You could find the people I talked to, and they were running the country then, uh, most, yeah, you know, that I talked to, didn't talk the way you were just talking they did not defend their right to just grab this territory. On the contrary, everyone I talked to said, "We are. you come back and you'll see, I remember it so clearly, we will treat these people better than the Jordanians or the Egyptians. That was their argument. I went into Gaza and the people who took me around said, see, this was not a great life for these people. We're going to show them now you know, th 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 this is not going to be an occupation. We're going to show them we are tolerant. We're going to show. So now. That, that, also, that, may be, that may be true. But if you, I mean, I would encourage you to look at um, some of the, some of the work by Gershon Gorenberg, for example. I, the first act, the first activities to settle the West Bank started immediately. They started during the 67 war. The, the activities to, to change the status of Jerusalem and to expand Jerusalem's borders to include a massive part of the West Bank, that was days after the 67 war. I mean, there may have been, and I'm sure, I mean, I know my left wing friends in Israel, there's certainly an element in Israel that from day one, said this is going to be the bone in the throat, right? This is this is the great philosophers of Israel saying don't do this. But there was always a part of the Israeli body politic, religious or security, that said, no, 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 no. This is an opportunity to finally do what we wanted all along, which is keep all the land. Right. And and this is why I am deferring to you, because and I understand this other view. And I do think I let me be full confession here. I feel I was naive at the time. I was criticized, actually, because I wrote this for Ramparts Magazine and everything put us into bankruptcy. So some people thought I was actually very critical of Israel. But in terms of what the people from the old Labor Party told me who were then in power, I believed them. OK, I'm sorry. I, I, they didn't tell me. I don't think it's a matter of not believing them, but I think it's worth paying attention to, you know, when we look at the history of the settlement uh, movement, which is really the, you know, the, if the you want to talk about, you know, don't listen to what people say, watch what they do. The concrete steps that that basically from right after 67 made it pretty clear that the intent was not to to give the land back I'm, to Palestine uh, or anything else. I mean, it was under labor governments that the settlement yeah, movement I, got its start, okay. not Likud governments. Right. But and I'm I, I'm not disagreeing with you. What, I'm just talking about my na own naivete, uh, which over the years I saw was naive, and I think I was sp spun <laughs> that this was a line. And then, you know, and yes, I had a lot of friends who were in Hashemir Hatzemir and the left wing kibbutz movement, and who were also active in the army. And some of them were high officers. I think more officers came from the kibbutz movement, and the, even the leftist kibbutz movement, and from the rest of the society, even though it was only 3% of the country. At some point, they had like 80% of the officers and so forth. 
what I'm getting at, and the reason I brought up the gatekeepers, which I think for anybody who wants to pursue this topic, uh, supports your point of view. Because in the gatekeepers, I think it's five former leaders of Shinbet who were interviewed. And they all in the interview, and it was amazing that they consented to these interviews done by Israeli film crew and so forth. And none of them said they were misquoted as far as I could see. And, you know, I think it was nominated for an Academy Award, didn't get it. But what it, I've, I've shown it many times as a teacher and so forth. What impressed me is they knew, the people administering the West Bank, even though they came out of a more idealistic and, and also not just idealistic, they knew if you tried to control people with torture and brutality and so forth, that you will transform yourself and you will create an enemy that would be difficult to deal with, much larger than just in that community, which we're seeing now in the world. And in the movie really explores their self-examination. The reason they were going through this self-examination, all of them, and the reason they think the movie got made was because of the assassination of Rabin and the disruption of this, what was the one time when they may have come close to actually solving this problem. That's what I'd like you as a witness of that time to analyze, uh, because I think, because they all say in the movie, this is a disaster, what's happening. They do say it. Yet you're right. They looked the other way. They presided over it. They enabled settlements to happen and the lack of freedom for the Palestinians. And so that's what I want you to talk about. Now put on the, the scholarly hat or you know, write the in-depth report back to Washington. But that's, that is the moment of, of truth for the whole Israeli uh, experiment. You know, was anybody ever serious about coexistence, tolerance, a Switzerland in the area where everyone would feel secure, uh, did uh, never again mean never again for everybody in the world, any group, or was it only for uh, one religious group? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not quite trying to answer that. That's a lot of, a lot of questions packed in there. Uh, I will say that I, I think it's I, I'm I'm hesitant to or I'm not going to generalize for the entirety of the population of Israel. I have dear friends who have spent their entire lives fighting for peace, fighting for Palestinian rights. I don't think this is about you know was there ever a genuine commitment? I think there absolutely were Israelis who are committed to Oslo or even committed to going beyond Oslo. Who you know I've got friends who've been talking about you know secular binational state for decades. Um, that's there. The reality, though, is that those who have accumulated power successfully in Israel over the years, um, part of the, the the accumulating of power has come from adopting an anti-Palestinian, uh, what I would call Jewish supremacy outlook, um, and that that goes way back. I would, you know, in addition to the gatekeepers, I would encourage people to watch the movie called A Law in These Parts, which has direct interviews with the different with different people in Israeli government and Israeli military. What's the title again? It's called A Law in These Parts. Um, and it tracks the, the legislation and the regulations that essentially pave the way for, for what is, you know, apartheid across the West Bank. Um, this didn't happen by accident. This happened by a series of if systematic laws and regulations, which have only continued, you know, long past, long past that. Um, you know whether or not there are, are Israelis who are who still today would like to see peace and security and all of that. I mean, increasingly as I think about this, I think about this as being less about do people want peace and peace can mean all different things, and more about whether Israelis um, have come to believe and have come to be taught over the years that you know they're they don't need peace, right? If under Perez the argument was you got with Oslo. Uh, Shimon Peres, basically, his argument was you have to make peace because if you make peace, you'll get all these benefits from the Arab world. And if you don't make peace, you won't. You'll give things up. And the argument of people like Netanyahu, even in that era, was you're wrong. We can pocket all of those wonderful things and not have to give up anything. And only a sucker would give up things they don't have to give up. And I think they, that, that argument has been proven largely correct. Another argument that was used for years, I mean, I, I, I worked with the peace camp for years. I worked with Peace Now, the, the American arm of the Israeli peace movement. 
And the main arguments that we used um, in terms of you know, trying to convince people that, that it was important to have a two-state solution. Argument number one was, if you don't have a two-state solution, you're going to have to choose between Israel being a Jewish state and a democratic state, right? Because the hordes of Arabs having babies, it won't be a Jewish state anymore. So you'll have to say, we are not Jewish and we stay in control of the Jewish people, or we have real democracy and it's not Jewish. And, and you know what? That turned out not to be a good argument. That turned out to be an argument that the right actually embraced. They said, absolutely. And given that choice, we say Jewish state democracy means something else, right? We don't, we're not interested in, in Western style democracy. We live in the Middle East and Jewish is more important. And, and I mean, the, the left gave permission for that argument by using this incredibly racist um, demographic argument as the main hook. We, we gave permission for it. Um, and, and, and here we are today. And, you know, Israelis look at this and they say, I don't want to give up my privileges. I live in a successful, wealthy Western economy. I don't want to have to deal with this and I don't have to. And, but, and, but, and but let me just stop you because what you're saying is really quite alarming. You're saying that one of the great traditions in the human experience involving the Jewish people, uh, largely out of adversity, largely out of being in uh, an oppressed people, largely out of being uh, experiencing the intolerance of others. Uh, after all, this is what most Jewish people experienced. Uh, throughout the world, certainly the European experience. And out of that came these values that I myself was raised and, and to this day respect of the great Jewish writers and thinkers and so forth. I mean, uh, many of whom were very critical of the Zionist experiment to begin with uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think most American Jews, and I would remind people, most of us uh, were from a working class background and, uh, you know, had to endure. And we and there was anti-Semitism in the United States that people had to deal with as well as in other parts of the world. And out of that came, I think, an admirable tradition. That's why there were so many Jewish people in the American civil rights movement in disproportion to their presence in the population. That's why they still vote. Uh, more uh, progressive than the most population. You're basically saying that all of that is dead in relation to Israel. And because if it's in dead in relation to Israel, it's in dead for the experience of most Jewish people since Jewish lobbying organizations and, uh, you know, and Israel itself are very intimidating to say to any Jewish person, if you don't agree with us and you don't see that we represent 100% of what Judaism is, you are self-hating, you are an enemy, you are an anti-Semite, right? Uh, you're really talking about the end of a Jewish experience that many Jews identify with as the essence of Judaism, okay. including, including religious Jews. By the way, we thought it was up to an almighty to decide where land gets distributed rather than for secular people. They were quite suspicious uh, of this movement for most of its history. Yeah, I mean, th there are people who've written about this and who are much more um, scholarly than I than I am. I mean, I am. We're, I am we're all... doing our best. They're be people who've discussed it much more scholarly than I am, but it bothers me. Is why well, I'm it, doing this. It should. Really, yes. Yeah. I mean, it should bother you. It bothers. Look, I am called a self-hating Jew. I'm called an anti-Semitic Jew. I'm called the Jew in name only. I mean, I, I grew up basically. You know, it, I remember. When I was very young, it was talking about the right, the law of return in Israel. It was, it was explained to me that anyone who was Jewish enough to be killed by Hitler was Jewish enough to make Aliyah to Israel. And suddenly, I'm now living in a world where it doesn't matter what your um, level of faith is. It doesn't matter what your family, your genealogy is. It doesn't matter your self-identification. If you're not deeply Zionist in your political outlook, then you're not really a Jew. That's the Jew in name only or the un-Jew, or the as-a-Jew. I mean, it's like every day there's a new name to call us. Um, you know, I, I learned a, a term recently, the, 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 the invisibilizing of the, the non-Zionist and anti-Zionist Jews, where you have 
starting with the Trump era, with the, the philo-Semitism, with the Elon Cars and people in the Trump administration who basically framed it as pro-Israel is the opposite of, anti of anti-Semitism. So it doesn't matter if they pretty much actually hate Jews, as long as they're pro-Israel, they can't be anti-Semitic. To the current day, where you have basically, you know, the ADL and other people claiming that every campus protest against Israel is by definition anti-Semitic, notwithstanding the fact that maybe half the people there are Jewish, that they're holding Shabbat services in, in the encampments. They claim, no, it's anti-Semitic, because by calling it anti-Semitic, you can say, ah, hate crimes, Title VI, Title X, shut it down. And in the process, you, you literally invisibilize those Jewish people who do not align with a, a Jewish identity that puts Israel at the center of that identity. And, and just to add, I mean, this is, this is a, a, a point I, I make as often as I can. You know, one of the things that I've always agreed with the ADL on, and there's many things I've never agreed with them on, I've always agreed with the ADL that if you conflate Israel and Jews, you're an anti-Semite, right? So if you don't like Israel and you, you, pr you show that by going to the house of someone with a mezuzah and, you know, painting free Palestine on their, on their door, just simply because you saw a mezuzah, you assume they're pro-Israel, that's anti-Semitic, right? All Jews don't equal Israel. Israel doesn't equal all Jews. That has always been the position of the ADL and of the Jewish community, except now our position as a community also is Support for Israel is intrinsic to Jewish identity, and therefore, criticism of Israel and Zionism is anti-Semitism. So they want to have it both ways. If you conflate, you're an anti-Semite, and if you don't conflate, you're an anti-Semite, which really leaves place only for one thing, which is supporting Israel. <laughs> and that's, that's where we are today. So, uh, I hope we're not the other day, but but uh, I mean, there seems to be. You point out how many Jewish people have spoken up. I mean, uh, there is a possibility the truth will set us free. There's a possibility maybe this has gone too far, and people are shocked. Because I I must say uh, I'm, I haven't seen any polling on this, but you know I. I, I uh, so, you know, I, I meet a lot of Jewish people. I haven't met one who's really happy with the situation. Uh, I don't think I've met a single one. I noticed uh, on the campus where I teach, uh, when people were speaking out and challenging the administration at USC for University of Southern California for changing the graduation so the person who was supposed to get the you know, uh, uh, the uh, biggest student honor. And we, suddenly we didn't have a graduate. And I went to the faculty meeting and uh, it seemed to me uh, a majority of people, or a certainly large number of people, either identified themselves as Jewish or were Jewish. So I wonder if, and let me ask you, and I was going to ask you about your work. Uh, we'll close this by asking you about your work as, with the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Uh, and again, this is not based on any polling. And polling about Jews is very difficult. I know I, I ran one at the LA Times when I was working there, and it's hard because it's a small population scattered. But at that time, uh, you know, there, there, this was 30 years ago, no, 20 years ago, whatever. Uh, the, the sentiment in the polling was, yes, Israel should be defended. But then you say, but by peace or by war, it was peace. And, and I have not, I've seen more support or more concern about where Israel is going now among Jewish people, again, totally unscientific observation. I wonder if there isn't a source of optimism here, that the journey that you have followed might be one that others will take, because there is something, I mean, that you seem to make light, I don't know, light of it, but I'm thinking of Hannah Arendt. That happened that when I came back for the six day where I spoke at the Hebrew Y in, in New York, and there was a whole big discussion, and I was on a panel. And yeah, I got criticized and everything. But this old lady at that point came up to me. I didn't even recognize her and said, you have to keep doing this and saying because you're right about this. And it was Hannah Arendt. I, I didn't wow. even make the connection. and uh, and And so... I, I just wonder whether this has gone too far, uh, that, that basically Jewish people are committed 
to decent values and understand that intolerance is what anti-Semitism is really about. Intolerance affects, in Germany case, a, a lot of people, Slavic people, gay people, uh, uh, people who had medical issues and so forth. Uh, and that is supposed to be the fountain of the tolerance and the enlightenment that Jews bring to the world. No, uh, that's that's and that's supposed to have a, a biblical base. Uh, I don't want to spin it too fine or claim great authority, but you're acting as if it's game over. I, I don't. I'm not acting. I, I don't mean to act like it's game over. I think that dealing with the. I've spent the past much like most every Palestinian I know, I, I have spent every day since October 7th looking what's happening on the ground, um, which leaves you um, sort of moving wildly between rage and despondency and total loss of faith in humanity. Um, you know, I, I, I agree. There, there, there is reason to be hopeful in terms of a new generation that's coming out and standing up, and that includes a large number of Jewish youth um, who are speaking with unbelievable clarity that I think puts previous generations to shame. That is that is wonderful and it is a source of hope. Um, for me, you know, it, it's not just, there, there is the, that's great and I encourage it. And at the same time, you know, I am just like you uh, probably talk to people every day who will say, it's not genocide. I say, well, if I stop calling it genocide, will you do something to stop it? I mean, this is this is not a hypothetical situation of you know zero sum outcomes on the horizon, and I, I take very I I I I am very hopeful that a new generation cares more about the values that I that are my values as a human being, as a Jew, as an American, as all those things, and it, and is and living the courage of their convictions. I'm watching them in a race with Congress and APAC and the EDL as they try to. Um, legislate a new definition of anti-Semitism, which says all of this is anti-Semitic and can be punished. I think they're mm. in a race with the efforts. You know, the number of universities that came back to school year this year, in order to shut down or or con to contain um, protests related to Israel, have adopted policies that basically contain and shut down protests on anything. And this is being praised by the people who supposedly represent. Um, Jewish Americans. It, 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 it's absurd to me. I don't know where the tipping point is where the broader Jewish American population gets up and says, you know, this is not about our safety. This is illiberalism that is that is not aligned with anything we believe in. And we're not going to say for the sake of an Israel exception, we're going to support illiberalism. But that's where the community, much of the community and the legacy organizations that are still viewed no. as representing and leading the community are. So I think in the longer term, there are reasons to hope about a shift in the population Right now, I've got to be honest, as we go into, you know, a year of genocide and it was expanding ethnic cleansing in the West Bank, that's what I'm really consumed by. Um, and, and how do the forces on campus and elsewhere, um, how do they accumulate enough power that somebody listens to them? Um, because it's a good effort that's going on right now, but it's not preventing you know, almost daily massacres in Gaza that are being done in the name of Israel. They're done by Israel, which insists it's doing it in the name of the Jewish people and democracy and freedom and liberty and all these things. Well, really, it, it's just genocide. I don't disagree with that. And I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to end this right now because I'll feel like a fool uh, for trying to see a brighter side of this. Uh, I'm embarrassed, actually. No, but you're <laughs> no, not a. No, but you're no, not. No, I mean, no, there no, is no. a brighter side. You're absolutely right. And I try to. It is something that in my own writing, you know, when I'm talking about the all the all the 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 things that are aligned against Palestinian rights for the first time in my lifetime, there is a significant movement aligned with Palestinian rights. For those of us born after '67, this is the first time in our lifetime that we've ever seen this. It's extraordinary. And, and, you know, I, if you were to talk to people organizing activism, I think you'd get people who are a lot more energized and excited to talk about it. Um, for me, the, you know, looking at 
you know, the, the U.S. political scene and looking at the, the statements coming out of the organized leadership and the insistence from right wing illiberal members of Congress that in order to support Jewish safety, they have to demonize anyone who criticizes Israel and Zionism. Um, I'm much more focused right now in the short term um, and, and, and figuring out what any of us can do. Um, you know, I've had conversations with Israeli left wing friends of mine since October 7th where they talk about, and this particularly early on, when they were talking about we have to focus on the allegations of mass rape and we have to talk about the betrayal that the Jewish left in Israel felt because the Palestinian, you know, their Palestinian counterparts were, were either not sufficiently upset or about what happened to Jews on October 7th, whatever. And I had these conversations with people where I, I said, you know, I get it. Can we put a pin in that and come back to it and first stop genocide? And then we'll come back to all of this, I promise. And the answer I got over and over was no. Our hurt feelings, our justification, our demand to be dealt with, everything is more important than stopping genocide. And I, I, I still don't know how to, how to contend with that. Um, it's, it, it, it's so far outside of the value system that I hold and was taught. Well, I'll tell you what Hannah Arendt told me at that time. And it was a very, it wasn't a lengthy conversation. She said, you have to keep pushing this. Yes. That's what she said. And, you know, she certainly did that. I, but I think we should put on record here what is really at stake. Because if, if, if you can accept, and we haven't discussed the, the horror of what's going on, and you're somebody who knows the area and so forth. But if, uh, if Jewish people come as a group, in particular in the diaspora as well, to accept this is legitimate or whatever word you use, it, it's what? It's mass violence, it's terrorism. There's no question. And I, I, I'm not big on the internet, I mean on social media, but uh, by the way, I have had very little influence with students. I was actually quiet about this issue when it started, you know. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in my life dealing with it. Every time I get near it, it's a third world issue and what have you. I found uh, students coming up to me, including Jewish students, and asking me why I was not speaking about it, why I wasn't bringing it more into the class. Uh, you know, so this was a coming from below. This was not as far as I could see, manipulative faculty or anything. Faculty generally has been cautious uh, because, you know, uh, about this issue. They know what it can do to careers and, and so forth. And, uh, and I, as I understand it on social media, I remember just a little connection. I remember during the Vietnam War at Ramparts, we did something that people questioned whether it was in good taste or not. We showed what napalm was doing to children in Vietnam. And uh, we, we ran pictures uh, 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 and so forth. And, and people said, well, that's in bad taste or so forth. But it happened that Martin Luther King bought a ramparts at the airport station where he was waiting for a plane. He looked at those pictures and then he said, after looking at that, I have to speak out against the war. I'm told now by uh, people that I run into, students who came up in a conversation just yesterday, that on social media, because I was saying, why aren't we showing it on my own website? And they say, you don't have to. It's all over social media. You can't, you can't ignore it. So maybe that's one of the really positive things about the internet. Whether, whether you choose to define it as genocide or no, it, it is of that order. And, and clearly the evidence is out there. And so finally, because in your article on APAC, you raised really the question uh, and we're talking about the leading uh, lobbying organization, and maybe this is the illusion of uh, Netanyahu and others around him, that they can spin anything. They can create the solution. But the main thing Israel had going for it in all of my life of observing this was the argument that we are victims of a historic injustices that have been perpetrated. And as a result, we are the standard bearer of the torch of freedom and decency. And that's why our values are modern and what have you. I'm sorry, we should stop the interview. What happened? They had it reserved. Oh, 
I have to give up this room. Now we have to edit this at the end. No worries. Uh, okay. Uh, God, I didn't think we went so long. Uh, but but I, I think this is, oh, God, it would be hard to splice, but I'll have to tell them to do it. But it, it, it's really, uh, I mean, I, I just, it, it's, it, it couldn't be a more basic question about the human condition. I mean, what does it mean? That people who have suffered as much as you look, my mother lost her whole family. I, my whole family, you know, um, um, my father was not Jewish. My father's family killed my mother's family. They were German. So I've lived with this issue my whole life. I mean, they didn't set out to kill him, but, you know, uh, his landsmen, that's what they did. And, and, and my mother's family in Lithuania, every one of them died. So I was raised in an environment, yes, yeah, some people were more Zionist, some were not, some were leftist. There was always you know, the old joke, you could have a thousand different views from five different Jews and all that. And what you're really painting is really the end of the end of what was most vital, exciting, uh, morally significant about the entire Jewish experience, whether in the religious realm or in the secular. That's really what, what you're saying is happening before our eyes. I mean, I, I don't know about I, I mean the end. I, I would say that it's it's certainly a new era. Um, if if my generation, our era was defined by sixty seven and seventy three, and this idea of Jewish righteousness and Jewish victimhood, and before that it was the Holocaust in forty eight. I, I don't know how the future of the Jewish people, because of the absolute conflation of Judaism with Zionism in Israel, I don't know how the future of the Jewish people going forward is not some somewhat different. Now that it is defined as a, defined by the experience of committing genocide, and committing genocide that is live streamed to the entire world. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I hope you're wrong, uh, but uh, we haven't talked about the tragedy that that's involved now, and and it doesn't get swept away, nor should it. And um, all right, uh, I want to thank you uh, for doing this work, for enlightening us, and uh, well, hopefully it'll change attitudes. Uh, thank, you. Wanna, thank you for having me. Yeah, I want to thank Christopher Ho and Laura Kondarajian at KCRW, the NPR station in Santa Monica, for putting this on. Joshua Shear, who uh, booked you uh, for this, who's our producer. Uh, Diego Ramos, who writes the introduction. Max Jones who does the video. I want to thank the JKW Foundation in memory of Gene Stein, uh, a great American public intellectual and writer uh, who actually was early on uh, in, in, in criticizing what was going on in the uh, occupation of West Bank and was a close uh, ally and supporter of Edward Said, a, a, a may, maybe the most important uh, person who criticized all this in real time, and Integrity Media Foundation, which in the interest of having diverse points of view with uh, human rights uh, concern for supporting the show. See you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence.